It's not a good horror film if you don't actually feel for the thing that you're also simultaneously terrified of and maybe even trying to destroy. This is actually where, like George and I would talk a lot about video games, where video games kind of have gone awry. Except for games like Until Dawn, a lot of video games are just about killing the monster, but you don't get an opportunity to develop sympathy and feel conflicted about killing the monster. That's actually the, the sort of power, the potency of horror films. So Dr. Steve Slossman is assistant professor, uh, MD, excuse me. It matters uh, to my mother, so it's good that you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and a psychiatrist at Mass at uh, MGH. Uh, he majored in English and biology at Stanford University. And after teaching high school English and science, he attended Dartmouth and Brown University Med Schools. He is a novelist and short story writer. And George Romero, ooh, uh, optioned Steve's first novel for films. Uh, most recently, Steve collaborated with Larry Fessenden at Glass Eye Picks to create a virtual reality horror miniseries. Uh, Steve teaches psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and film and creative writing at Harvard University. So let's please give it up for Dr. Steve Slossman. Thank you. I'm going to shake your head. Oh, but I made you drop my bio. Um, you guys are so close. This is like a horror film. Um, so thank you, uh, first of all, uh, folks, for showing up and people are watching. And also, thanks so much to the... Um, Cafe and to WGBH. Um, this, is, this is a topic that is near and dear to me, and it's one that I continually have to explain to my mother that I'm still an actual physician when I'm talking about horror films. So part of our goal today will be to kind of tell you the science behind it, uh, be, because there is a lot of science behind why we like these films, and just kind of fair warning. Um, well, let me just get a show of hands. Because it turns out that this is not something that people are kind of in the middle on. How many people like horror films? Okay. And how many people don't? And obviously there's a selection bias because you're, you happen to be here. Um, the, the course I teach at um, the undergraduates at Harvard is a freshman seminar on horror films. And usually it's about the same ratio. About two-thirds really love them. About a third say, actually, I don't. And I want to know why some people do. Um, so we can't do a whole course here. But we can do half an hour of that. So sorry to turn my back on you. Um, I wanted to, let me just tell you a little, I'll do this the, the Harvard way, and I'll just talk about me for a second here. Um, so I am a, a child psychiatrist. I grew up in Kansas City, went to college out west and taught there. Came out here to train and stuck around, and made babies, settled down. Did, didn't think I'd stay in New England. Nothing against New England, just didn't see it. I thought I'd go back west. I love it here, and I love it precisely because of gatherings like this, where we get these sort of academic mingling. But what comes with these academic mingling are horrific titles like this first one here. Um, horror and science and gore, oh my. Oh, I can look up there, sorry. Neurobiology, cultural shifts, and our abiding affinity for scary movies. That's the sort of classic horror, or classic, well, it is horrifying, classic Harvard beginning of a, of a talk. I would rather call this something else. How do I explain this to my kids and my parents? How do I like make the case that I'm actually doing something relevant when I'm paying good money to go see They Look Like People, or It Follows, or The Babadook, or there's some really, really great films out there. And because I want to make this personal, I'm going to show you my people. Those are my kids. That may look like breakfast, but that's actually dinner, because when dad's in charge of dinner, he makes breakfast. That's a cliche, but that's what we've been doing for millennia. And those are my folks. Um, my dad's a retired pulmonologist. My mom's a teacher. Like I said, every time I do one of these gigs, she says, but you're, you're still a doctor, right? Like, even though you're doing this. I don't even have my wife up there because my wife exclusively likes movies about sad, starving immigrants. And um, if someday Nova wants to talk on that, we'll bring her and she'll do that talk. Um, but she, she hates me. So this is a common thing that actually um, spouses deal with and or partners deal with. And so you end up finding your horror community. And we'll talk about that. Some of actually the um, mirror neuron affinity for connectedness that happens in the, in the horror genre um, is super important. And we're going to talk about the science behind that. The first thing you do to your family members who don't agree with you, that you think this is nonsense or this is trash, I mean, it's not, by the way. There's a ton of very um, fascinating scientific, neurobiologic, uh, cultural, cultural, psychological, critical writing about horror films. But the first thing you do is remind them that it's a community, and it's a terrific community really, really great, nice people. I, as an academic physician, I go to both academic meetings and I go to horror conventions. I 
I feel guilty telling you which one I like more. But I like the horror conventions more. They're, they're, people are really nice. Um, much, they have these tattoos of horrific demons on their arms, and yet they're the sweetest people you've ever met. And so these are some of the, as um, was mentioned, George Romero, who passed away this summer, as some of you probably know, he optioned my first novel. Uh, George was a super important mentor to me, and I just was working on this novel on the brains of zombies, cold called him. And he called me back, and we became friends. And he said, look, if we're going to be friends, Schloss, here's what you got to do. You have to watch the following movies. And he would send me a movie recommend, never horror films, movies like The Quiet Man, um, the, the John Wayne film. And then he'd say, call me when you've watched it, and let's talk about it. And it was this like private tutorial with this master. This guy, by the way, just on the side, when I was 11 years old, I snuck in to Dawn of the Dead. I told my parents I was going to see The Jerk but I snuck into Dawn of the Dead, and then I had to call for a lift home because I didn't want to walk home because I was too scared, and my parents said, is Steve Martin particularly frightening? I was like, no, I lied. It's my daughter. So I got in trouble for seeing this movie that 30 years later, the guy who made it options the book I wrote, which is so cool. And you hear these stories over and over again in horror films. The, on that stage there, there's George in the middle, and then that's Max Brooks off to the right, the guy who wrote World War Z and um, the Zombie Survival Guide. His dad, by the way, is Mel Brooks. Some of you guys know that. His mom was Anne Bancroft, so his mom was Mrs. Robinson, which is kind of funny to think about. So everyone's been super nice to me. Like, like, I'm just this schmo who decided to play around in this industry. Uh, Larry Fezzedin is the guy there on the right. Um, he owns Glass Side Picks. It's a great independent film studio. Larry's a very talented film writer, maker, director. Um, he and I just wrote that miniseries together. He, similarly, I just called him, said, Larry, I really like your work. Could I play with you someday? And he said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. He, when we get together all the time. Now still, my wife has said, this doesn't count. This isn't like real work. So then I point out we do cultural things. George and I went to Shakespeare festivals all the time. That's my oldest daughter, Sophia. This is clearly before my primary care doc gave me a lecture about my weight, as you might see from the photo. And, but that line there is not sweat. That's Romero's shadow, because he was six feet seven, or not six, he was about six four, and I'm five six on a good day. So his shadow sort of cast on me. And that's his wife, Suzanne, there. Um, when George passed away this summer, it was, it was heart-wrenching, but his memorial service was so moving because there was one person after another, the props guy who said, I just put my card on the table once, and he picked it up and said, yeah, you're my new props guy, just like that. So there's this cool connectedness within the industry. But still, I think we owe our loved ones an explanation because we are asking them to look at images like that, right? So what movie's that? Alien, right, it's a great film. Um, how many folks remember when they, I, I'm just, how many people have seen this movie? It's, it's, it was the beginning, right? It was one of the first true science fiction horror films. Remember the tagline, in, in space, no one can hear you scream. Everybody heard me scream when I saw this <laughs> film. Um, we gotta make, we gotta tell our wives and husbands and kids that we like this, and it's a fantastic film, but to do that, I think we owe them a little bit more explanation. So that's our agenda. We're gonna, I'm gonna make the case in the beginning that we need stories, that since we humans have been trading information with each other, we've been doing it in the format of narratives. And among those narratives have been scary stories. We've used them for all sorts of purposes, most commonly for the same way, reasons we use them today, as means of social commentary, of political, um, criticism in the campy displacement that horror affords. So you can say things that you can't say straight up. You can say them in displacement. That's what Night of the Living Dead was. We're then going to make the case that horror itself is this increasingly popular genre, and I'm going to show you the graphs. We know that horror movies are becoming more and more and more prevalent, and there's some reasons for that. We're going to talk about the fact that if you like horror films, it doesn't make you a horrible person, and there's some psychological data to support that, and then we're going to end up with the neurobiology. So that's our agenda, all in half an hour. We'll go fast. And there's some film clips in there. I'm sorry, there's not any gory film clips, but they're a little bit scary, um, just so you know. So the evidence that we need stories. If you were going to tell one of my very favorite French midi or not even medieval, it was more of a Victorian fairy tale, um, and you were going to do it as a bullet point, PowerPoint, the way we tend to present data these days, you would say in medieval France, I just have to read it off the slide, a woman gets married, she feels very lucky because her husband's rich, he leaves on business, gives her the keys to different rooms of the house, he says, hey, you can go in any room, but not this room, and if you do, I'll be mad. 
you've, you've heard this story a million times. It's the forbidden thing that you shouldn't go towards. There is no subtlety, no nuance to that. But if you look it up online, that's Bluebeard, which is one of the goriest fairy tales ever. If you folks have read Bluebeard, do you know what's in that room that you can't go in? It's all of his previous wives. And in what state are they? They are dismembered and hanging on meat hooks, right? So this is a story we told our kids back in the 1800s. So you can see the difference between telling it as a story and telling it as PowerPoint. It just doesn't have the same punch as a PowerPoint. And yet we continue to convey information in universities and in lectures in PowerPoint. I think it's such a disservice. If we were going to tell Bluebeard as a story with pictures, like in film, you could look up the etchings. And some of the etchings are awesome. That's a 19th century Victorian etching of, of Bluebeard. And you can see those sort of crazy wild eyes he's got. And, and the, um, it, it should be behind me there, too. Yeah. And the wife that he's meeting with. If instead you Google images, man buys wife house and gives her keys to house, you get that. <laughs> that's not nearly as, that's literally the first image that came up when I Googled it. So we need our stories to give kind of punch to the narrative. Otherwise, there is no narrative. Otherwise, it's just like a, nothing separates anything from anything. Everything kind of converges towards some similar photo like the generic photo there. Not a world I want. We also need our stories because they make us feel really, really good. So the midbrain lights up. When you read stories, the, the word novel comes from novelty. So whether you're watching a story or hearing a story, the regions of the brain that are responsible for secreting dopamine, the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus incumbens, the regions that actually get excited, the same regions of the brain that get excited when you do cocaine, which you should not do. As a physician, I advise against that. This is the safest drug you can do, reading stories and hearing stories. We know that your brain gets tickled when you hear a story. That's why we like hearing stories. That's why we've been doing it with each other since we've been doing anything with each other. If you like your stories to be scary, and if you like them on film, this is a good time for you, because horror films have been escalating. There's been more and more and more and more of them. So the, on these two graphs here, and I don't know if everybody can make them out exactly. Let's see if I can use the pointer. It doesn't work so well. So, you could see that there was this little spike around 1968, 1970. That was actually right when Night of the Living Dead came off. And then things shot up in the 80s with the beginning of the slasher films, so the John Carpenter films, the Wes Craven films. Similarly, a lot of these movies, on the, on the right you see the, world, uh, the um, American market, the left is the worldwide market, the right's the American market. A lot of this is being driven by American studios. Why is that? Why would American studios be particularly invested in horror films? Yeah, they make money. They're, they are low budget, high yield films. The margins are amazing. At the end of the day, it's a business. So what's really cool about horror, remember it's a business, so you can't get after them for wanting to make money. So they have found a modality here where they can get across fascinating, important social messages with relatively small budgets and have a huge yield at the box office that also creates lifelong fans. Horror films are the kinds of films that people see over and over and over again. So they go back again and again to the theater and then the derivatives that come later or the DVDs, or in my day, the VCRs, things like that. You keep buying, you want to share them with people. So horror itself is on the rise. And, and this is what we're seeing with studios like Bloomhouse and, and other places. Um, so one of the big changes was going from this modernist ex explanation. So modernism was science will save us. Science has all of our answers. And when we get into trouble, it's when we don't listen to the scientists. Frankenstein, which people argue started the horror scene um, at, at Universal uh, Studios in, in, here in the States, in 1931, was all about science. It was all like, we will get our explanations from science. The shift happened right around 1968, when you had movies like Night of the Living Dead, or later It Follows, which is a fantastic film, by the way. Each of those, you never get an explanation. I tend to favor those films. I like the films where you don't get an answer. We don't know why the zombies show up in Night of the Living Dead. You don't know what this entity is that's chasing these kids around and, and it follows. It just happens and you just have to deal with it. You don't have any rules to work with. That shift from a modernist perspective to a postmodernist perspective, that's key because that introduces the topic or the notion of uncertainty. We, you see this in some earlier films too, um, The Birds, for example, where you don't know why the birds are suddenly flocking. They're just flocking. That uncertainty is particularly um, intriguing and puzzling to our brains, and we'll talk about why that is. It has to do with pattern recognition. That's coming up in a little bit. 
Way before 1968, postmodern explanations, or lack of explanation, postmodern uncertainty, started declaring itself in existentialist literature. So Sartre wrote Nazi in 1938. And this passage is a horror passage if I've ever read one. It's, this has stuck with me since college, since I was teaching English and since I was an English major. Across the street, he'll see something like a red rag blown towards him by the wind. And when the rag has gotten close to him, he'll see that it is a side of rotten meat grinding with dust, dragging itself along by crawling, skipping, a piece of writhing flesh rolling in the gutter, spasmodically shooting out spurts of blood. No, he never offers an explanation for why this happens or what it is. His whole point was this stuff just happens in the world. We can't remember, this is like at the dawn of World War II at this point. So bad stuff happens. We have to learn how to cope with it. We might not be able to explain it. And as often happens in literature and film, literature predates the film. So the stories come out first in the writing, then the filmmakers sort of pick up on it, either just through the cultural milieu or because they actually read it, and then they make the movies. Having said that, there were a series of rules laid out, literally codified by Universal Studios, starting in the 1930s with um, uh, Frankenstein, and then later with like Frankenstein Meets the Werewolf and Bride of Frankenstein, all those movies that you got up early if you were my age and watched on Saturday morning from 10 to 12 on the UHF stations. This was um, from an article in the Saturday Evening Post in 1942. These were the rules that the guy who was in charge of the horror genre felt had to be in every movie. He felt that they had to be once upon a time tales. This was to rescue the audience. We'll see this in a second, a clip from Frankenstein. There had to be a scientific premise we got away with that, with the postmodern stuff. We had it for a while, pre-1968, but then it sort of started to drift away, and now the horror comes from not knowing. He felt there had to be a naysayer, somebody who said this can't possibly be the case. I'll show you a clip of Dawn of the Dead, where the scientists are arguing with each other because they are in over their head. They don't know what's going on. There should be cool technical effects. They don't have to be expensive. They've got to be cool. That's why you see the same sets over and over and over again in horror films. Um, the Frankenstein set from 1931 was so popular that it showed up in 12 other movies, not even always about Frankenstein. Just kept showing up, that same electricity going up and the rising the bed up above into the ceiling of the castle that opens up. There has to be a major and then a secondary monster. So Igor was the secondary monster in the first Frankenstein. The idea there is because of pattern recognition, we compare the monster to ourselves. And if the monster is so far away from us, we need someone in the middle. That was literally their thinking. So you're going to introduce the audience first to the humans, then to the slightly more monstrous monster, like Igor, and then to the monster, him or herself. And then you have to. Um, tell people that it's a horror film. It's not fair to just spring the movie on them and not have it be a scary movie. They actually literally did that in the clip I'll show you of Frankenstein, where before the movie started, as part of the movie, they had somebody come on, and then you have to have sympathy for the monster. You gotta feel bad for him. It's not a good horror film if you don't actually feel for the thing that you're also simultaneously terrified of and maybe even trying to destroy. This is actually where, like, George and I would talk about video games, where video games kind of have gone awry. Except for games like Until Dawn, a lot of video games are just about killing the monster, but you don't get an opportunity to develop sympathy and feel conflicted about killing the monster. That's actually the, the sort of power, the potency of horror films, at least in my opinion. I think we're stuck to these rules with the exception of moving from this modernist to this postmodernist place, where we've gone from this, like, we will explain everything by science to, geez, we've tried, we've got really good scientists, but we can't make sense of it still. So with that, I want to show you this first clip. This is um, from Frankenstein in 1931, and this is clearly modernist. This is, this is science. This is a horror film. I'm telling you it's a horror film. Now you get to leave if you want to leave. They actually felt this was absolutely necessary because they felt they couldn't show people something this frightening without first doing a kind of warning ahead of time. Have is, folks seen the original Frankenstein? I'm just curious. How do you do? Mr. Carl Lindley feels it would be a little unkind to present this picture without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. I 
think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now is your chance to... Uh, well, we've warned you. It literally began that way. Well, we've warned you, and then walked out. That was, that was what they felt was absolutely necessary. It is about science. The science we understand, but we took it too far. It is scary, and you can leave now if you want to. Let's contrast that now with the scene from Dawn of the Dead. And this was really one of the first movies that made a massive impact on me. This came out in 1978. Romero made Night of the Living Dead in 68. He didn't, by the way, I don't know if you guys know this, he didn't copyright it because he didn't know he'd be a filmmaker. He was the chief cameraman for Mr. Rogers at the time, literally. And he made this movie on the side for about 10,000 bucks. And the movie took the movie world by storm. Part of the reason it took the movie world by storm is you could show it anywhere you wanted. He never copyrighted it. I guess that's the proper verb. So people could show it anytime they wanted. But more importantly, it was a pretty devastating film. Prior to that, horror films were things like Frankenstein or I Dated a Teenage Werewolf. They were like cautionary tales about not dating older men. And suddenly, you had this movie, right? This um, Night of the Living Dead, that was such a hit that it took him 10 years. He made some other great movies in between. Martin, one of the best vampire movies I've ever seen, before he got around to Dawn of the Dead. So just to set this up, they're holed up in a mall right now. The zombies are all outside. The world is on the brink of ending. This plague is spreading. They've got everything they need in this mall. They have, even have an ice skating rink. They have coffee, they have bed, they have drinks, they've got food. They can stay there for years. They're just bored. That's the main horror here. It's not that there's zombies out there. It's, that it's no life to be stuck in a mall. It's a terrible thing to be stuck in a mall all the time. You get mallsy. So you get stuck in the mall, and their buddy, Flyboy, that's his name, the guy who flies a helicopter, has been bit. And he says, shoot me if I come back. I'm going to try not to come back. I'm going to try just to die. He doesn't say, shoot me now, which he could say. He says, I want to die the regular way. And if I don't die the regular way, if I wake up, I need you to shoot me. So, and you see this in a thousand zombie films. So they're like taking turns guarding him. And in the meantime, the television is on while they're eating. And the scientists are arguing about what to do about this plague. So I'm going to skip to the center of this because it's too long a clip to show you all of is usually intact enough to be mobile when it revives. What are you saying? I mean, you know, you scientists. Dummies! You're suggesting... Dummies! Hey, listen! Dummies! Ma'am? Excuse me. Listen, quiet, quiet. Shh! One wonders whether it's worth saving. It's worth saving. <laughs> For all I know, the brains are already dead, and it's the idiots that are still alive. Huh? And I figured out how to stay alive, too. And I'm trying to help you, dummies. In your calm, helping way, you do irritate me by the illogical way. Illogical way. Illogical hell. Illogical hell. I'm showing you a way that we can up the food supply 20 times. Right. Food supply for who? For a whole specimen that is walking around there in increasing numbers. We should feed them. What else are you going to do with them? You <laughs> Give me an alternative. I thought you scientists could come up with an actual way to solve the problem rather than feeding the opposition. Doesn't make any sense. Well, I can think of one other alternative. I can think of another alternative. Yes. Since they seem to congregate in heavily populated areas, and since we haven't touched upon our nuclear resources, why don't we drop bombs in all the big cities? You're probably oh, serious. I'm deadly serious. What are the choices? They won't run out of food, young lady. That's the problem, you see. And they won't run out of food while we're still alive. These kind of things out. You know, the things that you're talking about here sound like just a bunch of people talking. This is not without actual rhetoric. We're not out. fighting. This is not the Republicans versus the Democrats. They've got us in the hole economically, or we're in another war. It's more crucial than that. We are down to the line, folks. We are down to the line. There are no divisions among among living societies. Please let him finish. Let us know. Whatever. It's really all over, isn't it? Quiet. Unemotional. Quiet. We've got to remain rational, logical, 
logical. Yeah. Scientists logical. always think in those kind of terms. It doesn't work that way. That's logical. not how people really are. You've got to remain logical. We've got to. There's no choice. It has to be that. It's that or the end. It's a brilliant film. It's a brilliant scene. You hear him say, it's not the Democrats against the Republicans. This is bigger than that. This, was, this is the power of a horror film, where you can make these political statements, in this case about consumerism, because they're in a mall. And really, you're actually talking about something um, much more profound, the difference between being alive and not being alive. I apologize. It wasn't Flyboy changing there. It's Johnny. Flyboy changes later into a, a zombie. Not that it matters, unless you're very much a stickler. Someone will email me later. Horror also becomes highly derivative, and this is what creates community. If you've seen one horror film, you've seen them all. So The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is a great film, by the way, came out in 1974. There's Leatherface running around with his chainsaw. Um, I, this movie actually has a ton of critical writing about it. It's worth seeing. It's, a, it's not a gory film. It's a genuinely terrifying film, but it's also about economic deprivation. That's what they were aiming at. After that, Everybody wanted to use chainsaws. So if you've seen the Sam Raimi films, the Evil Dead 1, Evil Dead 2, or later Ash versus Evil, he's got a chainsaw that's connected to his arm, right? And then, because you've seen that before and people want to play with these ideas, you make it even further derivative and you add it in other settings. You try to tweak it a little bit higher, raise that bar a little bit. So if you've seen Planet Terror, you've got Rose McGowan with a semi-automatic weapon where her leg used to be. So you get these, like, it's all funny. It's, it's absurd, right? Like she has to fall down on the ground in order to shoot her leg gun at the creature, which makes no sense. Like, why not just carry it and then have something that she can walk on? This is what horror films are all about. These moments where um, it occurs to you that this makes no sense, but it's so much fun to watch. When in The Conjuring, when she goes down into this dark tunnel, she finds this tunnel. The movie is set in the 1980s. Her husband is a contractor. He's got flashlights, and yet she uses a match. She uses a match to, and why? Because it's a great scene. You know that match is going to go out right when some horrible face shows up. Um, so the filmmakers love that. That's a derivative moment. You've seen that in a thousand films, and this is why you should see horror films, by the way, in the theater because everybody's in on it at that point. Everybody starts laughing. Horror films are the only films where not only is it permissible, it's expected that you scream at the theater, right? You're supposed to say, what are you doing? A match? You don't need a match? Or wait, she's got a gun on her leg? That makes no sense. Everybody can laugh and have fun with it or scream when stuff happens. From a psychological perspective, the average age when we see our first horror film, anyone take a guess at it? First horror film that you really like. What did you say? 13? Yes, yeah, so 11 to 13. That's the average age. There's been multiple studies, and they're Hollywood studies because they're, this is the, from the market research world. This means there's something transgressive about it because it almost certainly means you're seeing a movie when you're not old enough to see it. Right? It means that you're sneaking this movie in in some way, like when I snuck into Dawn of the Dead. Um, so that's me at a time when I had hair and bangs and things. That's actually my bar mitzvah picture, which is pretty funny. Um, that was the age I was when I first saw, um, I actually just was about to go see The Shining at that point. The first movie to really scare me when I was 11 was this. This was the made-for-TV Salem's Lot. Now, this scene by itself is not that scary, but if you can imagine being 11 years old, home by yourself, eating a Tostino frozen pizza, you got your dog next to you in your wood panel basement from the 70s, and this scene shows up, um, it's a terrifying scene, so I, I would like to share it with you guys. It's very short. To set it up, these two kids are coming home from school or from um, being out playing, their brothers. They take the shortcut through the woods. There's always a shortcut through the woods. They take the shortcut through the woods. The little boy disappears on the way back, so the older brother gets home. His parents are mad at him. Where's your little brother? I don't know. He got lost in the woods. We know he got lost because a vampire gets him. So they send the kid upstairs. They're mad at him. They go out to look for their, their younger son, and then the little brother pays a visit on the second story, and that's important to the older brother. What's funny is this is so hokey, but I love it. So pay attention to the music on this. I 
I was so scared at this moment. Like I'm reliving it now. Like I can remember it. And he's so clearly suspended by string, you know. <laughs> but but I was 11, and I thought, do not open that door. <laughs> and then I thought, I think he probably will open the door because it's his brother, and he feels guilty. Which isn't that different, by the way. Like I will have Thanksgiving with Uncle Bill, even though he didn't vote for the same guy. But... So he's gonna go. Slows down. Toby Hooper, the same guy who directed Texas Chainsaw Massacre, also directed this. And somehow this was on network television. You guys see it okay? You're not looking. You're not <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> he doesn't bite him, don't worry. He's just gonna kind of float there because they gotta cut the strings off for the next scene. You know? <laughs> that scene got me. That was the first one I remember being, I turned on every light in the house. I remember it like it was yesterday, but I remember it with a smile. And when you do market research on horror films, you find out that people who remember their first scary film, which is somewhere around 11 to 13, remember it with a smile. Horror is a neurocultural phenomenon. By that I mean your brain gets tickled by this, and it gets tickled as a function of what's going on in your culture. So if you watch horror films from South Korea, they're different than horror films in America, different from horror films in the Philippines, from Mexico, South America. And it's really interesting. You can learn a lot about the cultures by seeing what are their demons, what scares them. These are based on some fundamental principles, and that's what we're going to wrap up on now. One is pattern recognition. We'll define that. We'll define how pattern recognition yields these processes called metacognitive and meta-emotional exercises, thinking about what you're thinking, not just thinking, but thinking about what you're thinking. We're going to mention, and as we've already done already, this sort of connection to this blunt and sometimes subtle social commentary. We've already touched on the modernism and postmodern themes, and then we're going to talk about how this creates human connection through mirror neurons. We're going to do this with a pug, OK? That is a pug. We all know that's a pug. How do we know that's a pug? It's a pug. It looks like a pug, right? You wouldn't say it's a pug because it has a pushed in nose, and it's got a flatter face, and its ears fold down and not up. And if I asked you to differentiate a pug from a cat, you wouldn't say, well, cats have retractable claws and funky pupils. You would say, a cat looks like a cat, and a dog looks like a dog, and certain dogs look like pugs, and that's a pug. OK, that sets in. That pattern sets in, that pattern recognition. When you're around age two or three, it's an adaptive response. It allows you to very quickly size up your environment, compare it to other things in your environment, and say, OK, I recognize that. I know what it is, and I am comfortable with what it is. So we can play with pattern recognition. This is what horror films do all the time by doing something to this pug. And I promise I won't hurt this pug. We're going to take this very cute pug, and we're going to tweak him just a little bit and do that. So people laugh. People um, are sort of tickled by this picture. They don't know why exactly. So what have I done? What, did I, what kind of eyes did I put on the pug? Yes. Cat eyes, right. So now we have a cat eyes on, or the eyes of a cat on a pug. And it's unsettling to see. It's two things that don't quite match up. You recognize the pattern of cat eyes, and you recognize the pattern of a pug, and you mix them together, and your brain takes notice. Now it looks because the pattern doesn't quite fit. That's the key to horror films, having something that's familiar enough that you recognize it, but off just enough that you do a double take, that you look once or twice. You see this in all the films. That's a meta-emotional moment or a meta-cognitive moment. That's where you say, what was it about that pug that struck me? You go from the more primitive to the more sophisticated regions of your brain. So if you look at this image of the brain, the amygdala, the most primitive region, that's um, Greek for almond shape because it's an almond shaped region of the brain, that's the fight or flight area. That basically tells you, OK, I know what I'm looking at or I don't know what I'm looking at, but whatever, I'm either going to fight it or I'm going to run from it based on my recognition of patterns. 
This pug is slightly different. So the amygdala screams right away because it's different. The amygdala doesn't like things to be different. The amygdala likes things to be the same. So it kicks it north to the frontal lobe, to that prefrontal cortex. That's the part of your brain, which is actually pretty far from the amygdala, that we need to engage when we're frightened. We typically don't do that. That's why, you know, if you read Dune, Fear is the Mind Killer, when you get afraid, your amygdala screams so loud that your frontal lobe can't get in on the picture. In a horror film, you're sitting in the, in the um, seats, you know it's not real, it's like a roller coaster ride, so you're gonna be okay. That gives you time to kick it north to your frontal lobe. And in studies of folks who like horror films, they actually like the experience of being frightened and then the metacognitive experience that follows. And literally, that's the way they do these studies. Folks come out of a horror film and they'll say, did you like it? Did you like it? The people who liked it, they put them over here and they had everybody in the theater wired up so they could measure things like autonomic arousal, how fast they were breathing, how fast their heart was beating, whether they were sweating more, you can measure skin conductance. Those are all signs of a fight or flight response. People who liked the horror films actually had very high fight or flight responses. They were frightened. I was frightened when I watched that scene in Salem's Lot, but I also enjoyed it. And when they ask people, why did you like it? They say, I don't know, but I really did like it. And then they seem to really enjoy thinking about why they liked it. If you ever go to a horror convention, that's what a lot of the discussions are about. What makes this so scary? Why is this scary? I was on a panel once of um, horror writers, and they had like, I was the zombie guy, and there was a werewolf guy, and a vampire guy, and a ghost guy. And they asked us, what's the scariest one? And we all started thinking about it. What do you think, is this, what do you think we came up with? It's the scariest like of all the horror tropes. So some people said zombies. You said vampire. We all said ghosts. And we couldn't figure out why. So then we had to have this metacognitive exercise, like why ghosts? And then the guy who writes ghost stories, he said, well, because you don't know what they want. They just stare at you. Like zombies want to eat you and vampires want to seduce you and werewolves are just angry dogs in the woods. But ghosts, they just stare. They might not do you any harm, but they might be horrible to you. You don't know. And it's that uncertainty, that postmodern uncertainty that leads to the fear. Why would being frightened be fun? Well, because we have these great big brains and we love puzzles. We could spend all our time puzzling about what's going on in the White House, but that's not fun anymore. I'm tired of that right now. Um, I'm sorry to make it, it's hard to get through any talk without being a little bit political at some point. I'm tired, I don't wanna go there. But we can do this in our films, right? We can do this by watching these movies and using pattern recognition, asking ourselves, why are we so frightened? This is the formal definition of pattern recognition. This is first, one of the first times the term was coined in the Journal of Neuroscience. The brain goes through a matching process to determine which of the countless objects it has seen before best matches a particular object under scrutiny. Have I seen this? Yes, I've seen a pug. Yes, I've seen a cat. I've never seen cat eyes on a pug. Now I got something new. So think of all the horror films you've seen. Think of how they tweak what you're looking at. It's a very um, visceral experience. There's the priest from The Exorcist. When the demon finally jumps out of the little girl into him, he changes. He's still recognizable as the same man. And you're taken, a, it's a terrifying scene. You're taken aback by that very scene. You know what's funny? This movie scared me so much. I'm, I'm Jewish. There's no Satan in my world. And yet this movie terrified me. Um, so the demon, I just want to be wrong, you know? So the demon um, jumps into him, and if you spend some time thinking about it, what you're really seeing in the possessed priest are the signs of death. So the sunken cheekbones, the pinpoint pupils, um, what you're seeing is this thing that you viscerally recognize in your amygdala before your frontal lobe can get in on it. If you let your frontal lobe get in on it, it becomes really interesting really fast. That's from Pan's Labyrinth. Um, it's a great, great movie. Gil Guillermo del Toro is really a genius. To appreciate horror, we have to actually allow ourselves to get scared. We've gotta get scared. We've gotta make sense of what scares us. We, then we want to see it again. We want to solve the puzzle. And we do that as a function of pattern recognition. That's the key to enjoying a horror film. Why is the clown scary in it? Well, even before he shows you his 17 rows of teeth, he's in a sewer. Clowns don't belong in sewers. Clowns belong at birthday parties. If a clown is in the sewer, it doesn't fit the pattern. So this is, this is what all horror writers play with. This is what makes it actually fun. When in this postmodern world, sometimes they will yield for you 
the, the shocker. They'll say, here's what we've been fighting all along. And I, there's a little spoiler here, because this is a scene from The Conjuring. This is the scene where they actually show you what it is that's haunting these, this family. Usually right before the reveal is when they heighten the fear up highest. Because after that point, there's almost a kind of letdown. There's this relief. OK, now I know what it is. It's an evil fill in the blank, evil demon, evil witch, werewolf, whatever. But until then, you actually don't know what it is. So watch in this final scene that I'll show you how they build up the, um, the tension here. And I'm sorry, this is actually a very frightening scene, but it's also a great scene. You, I, I know you're not going to. Oh, you're not going to look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, the, it's a little bit hard to see me because it's dark in here, but her little sister is banging her head against the wardrobe. She seems to be sleepwalking. and the noise comes back. So it couldn't have been her head. That's the first metacognitive moment. Oh my god, it wasn't her. Now watch what they're going to do with camera angles, too. They're going to play with the pattern here. The camera's going to tilt up to make the wardrobe look even taller. The music comes on really slow. You've been taught to recognize music like this, so now you know you've been acculturated to it. She sits up. There's nothing there. The movie's all, after that, it's easy. Up to that scene, which is to me the most, I remember that scene in the movie, I was, I was really scared. And then when she threw that wardrobe open, I was thinking, I know there's nothing in there. I've seen enough horror films to know that she's going to do that. And there's not going to be anything there, but there's going to be something else in that room somewhere, and I don't know where it is. And I think it's going to be the little girl. And it turns out to be the witch demon who's on top of the wardrobe. After that, you know what you're up against. So when you do do the reveal, the horror films play with pattern recognition so you can recognize these things you've seen in other films because they're so derivative to enjoy yourself. Now, I want to end with the risks to my profession right now. So I am, a, I am an academic physician. Uh, my dean hasn't always been so happy with me playing around in this. He can't, I'm very grateful to the folks here because he cannot object to NOVA and WGBH. This gives me legitimacy. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm speaking at, um, you know, Scarefest 89 or whatever down in Orlando, then he's like, eh, I don't know if this is so great. Um, so, when I first wrote this, my, my first novel, the zombie novel, the one that um, Romero optioned, basically it created a little mini one of these. I wrote a piece about this for the New York Times. Uh, this is the cover of the times when Orson Welles did his famous reading of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And what he did, he created a level of verisimilitude that hadn't been done before. Rather than say, like they advised in the Frankenstein movie, we are now going to tell you a horror story, what they did is they actually started with their normal play. It was the Philadelphia Philharmonic. And they said, we're going to play music for you. And then they said, we interrupt this program to tell you there's been a series of gas explosions on the planet Mars more later. Then they came back, more music, and then Wells came on and slowly they introduced the story, modernizing it so it makes sense for the New York metropolitan area. And there was sporadic and significant panic. In fact, the newly minted FCC decided they had to figure out what to do about this. And their first plan, fascinatingly, was that Congress should vet every story that's ever told on the radio. But that was really their first plan. And then I think it wasn't so much about censorship, it was about the congressman saying, I don't want to do that. That sounds awful to look at every single story. So then they actually said, you know what we should do? We should come up with some means by which we can get information out to people quickly so that they will know that this is a story, something like the internet. But the problem is, the internet tells you what you want to know. So if you type, are Martians invading, into Google, it will say, yes, Martians are invading. That, because it senses that that's the question. It doesn't sense, but it's programmed to tell you that's what you want. So I wrote this zombie novel, and then I went on the radio late night. There's this, um, 
uh, late night AM radio show called Coast to Coast with Ian Punnett. And on Sunday or early Monday mornings, he plays it straight with you. So he acts like what you've written really happened. Max did this with World War Z. I did it with my book. And so he said, like, Dr. Schlossman, where did you find this manuscript? And I said, well, I found that on a robo server that was, I think, based in Southeast Asia, but I'm a little bit worried about who's looking at me right now. We were just having fun riffing off each other. And then we started getting emails like, oops. Sorry. That one. That's one of the many emails that started coming into both of us, and also, by the way, to my medical school dean. I find myself very angry after listening to your clever fun with Ian Punnett. My husband and I were driving on a long trip, and we listened to your interview with great confusion. What on earth is going on here, we asked. The psychiatrist evidently has academic credentials. We assumed a respectable professional. So what is this zombie disease? Many, many people thought this was real. They started calling the medical school PR department and saying, like, what do we do? How do we protect ourselves? Now, this was on a radio program from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. where they would interrupt every 20 minutes for a you know, commercial for lawn fertilizer, which I don't think you would do if there was really a zombie outbreak. But this is like you kind of believe what you want to believe. So I'm not meaning to ridicule. What I'm saying is that if you're like stepping into these different worlds, so I, I love being a, a physician and I love teaching medical students, but I also love telling stories. When this thing happened, the dean of the med school, not the uh, main dean, the guy in charge of education, was a friend of mine, but he said, Steve, you can't write any more novels. And I said, um, well, okay, I quit. And he said, what do you mean you quit? I said, I, I quit, I, don't, I like writing these novels. He said, well, I don't want you to quit, I just don't want you to write novels. I was like, no, I understand the terms. You were clear. I'm, I can find something else to do, but I'm having fun. I've wanted to be a writer since I was eight. I want to be a doctor since I was 27, and my dad made me. So I'm <laughs> happy to just keep writing here. And he said, okay, fine. Then can you just make some announcement that zombies aren't real? I said, wait, wait, so you want me to like call CNN and like say Harvard denies the existence of zombies? <laughs> like, is this what you want me to do? Because actually, if there were zombies, that's exactly what we would do, right? We would like deny it. Um, so that was a story in of itself. The reason I'm telling you this is like horror stories are really, really, really fun, but they need to stay in the fun realm. And when they make their way out of the fun realm, they can get scary fast. So like that crazy clown stuff that happened last year, where, and a little bit more this year, but all the really nutty stuff last year, that's not good for anybody. That actually takes it out of the fun place. If you take your kids to a haunted attraction, Canopy Lake, Six Flags, or any of the ones up in New Hampshire, and they say, I don't want to go in, don't make them go in. Don't, it makes no sense to force, like, it's time for you to go because I really enjoyed it. And, and, I, and I know it's, it comes from a good place because I love horror films. My older daughter hates them. My younger daughter loves them. So my younger daughter and I sit down and we watch scary stuff together. We don't watch, like, the really gory stuff, but we'll watch the R.L. Stein stuff. The, my older daughter, she can leave it behind. So let people sort of vote with their feet on that. Uh, George Valiant was a mentor of mine, a psychiatrist who studied uh, human adaptation to um, adversity, basically studied re resiliency. He mentioned humor as one of the main uh, ways that we cope with, with hard times. We make, you know, watch John Oliver, that's what he's doing, right? He's making jokes about hard times. Um, it always reminds me of my favorite uh, quote from the epilogue from my favorite Shakespeare play, The Tempest. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. That's Shakespeare basically turning through Prospero and saying, I've told you a lot of stories. I hope I haven't offended anybody. I'm trying to have fun. I'm trying to make some points. That's actually what horror films are about. And every horror filmmaker I've ever met says, this is not the way to live. These are cautionary tales about how not to live. These are about the mistakes we make when we don't think. That's, I think, the strength of horror films. So that's what I have for you guys. You should email me with any questions if we don't ask them tonight. Thank you so much for your attention. OK, so we'll start off with uh, Q&A. Uh, so we have about uh, seven or eight minutes or so for questions. Uh, so please be very brief with your questions. Um, and I'll pass the mic around. All right, who has a question? Hi, Dr. Schulzman. Uh, my name is Mason. Thank you very much for the speech. Sure. You have called me Steve. Only my mom Steve, calls I me Dr. Schulzman. Steve, I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Excellent presentation. I actually jumped at the witch. Um, what do you think the role of music is? Uh, you focused very, very much on visual stimuli. Yeah. Uh, it's huge. Um, like, that would be a whole talk in and of itself. Uh, if I can give a, a shout out on 
Thursday at the WGBH studio, I'll be part of a panel discussion, and one of the, um, there are three of us, one guy works in virtual reality, and there's a guy who works at Berkeley who's done a lot of horror musical scores, and he'll be talking more about that. But the, the role is, um, it's twofold. One is that there are certain, it's gonna, it's gonna vary culturally, right? So there's certain types of music, certain tonal types of music, certain um, keys that we're used to hearing in the West versus in the East. And then there's, um, the building of expectation based on previous recognition of sound. So that musical score you heard in The Conjuring, you've heard musical score like that about a thousand times. And that's on purpose, so you can remember it and recognize it. I've, I've talked to musical composers who, talk, uh, who say, um, you see this sort of layering, especially in horror films, where they always look at previous films, and they're, they're not, it's not, no one's worrying about ripping anybody off. It's like, let's use the same thing. So you've got this building of sound, or you do it to silence, right? So like, um, No Country for Old Men is not a horror film, although it is horrifying. That whole movie's quiet, except for the speaking. Is that? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's a huge player in it. Thank you, it's a great question. What's the... What's the scariest movie that you've seen? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, so I have a hard, I just watched actually, it's funny you should ask that because I just watched one of the first movies that I almost couldn't get through. And we're talking horror films. There are some very hard to watch movies that, that aren't horror films. Um, but there's this movie called um, uh, The Devil's Candy. It's an independent film out right now about a, a dad who's trying to give his daughter kind of this freedom to have artistic expression. And the dad loves metal music, and his daughter loves metal music. So he, he's imparting onto her this love. But also, he wants to paint his own stuff, but he's also painting butterflies because he has to make a living. And it just spoke to me, like personally, at, at sort of two levels. One is I've got kids, and the idea that my kid could somehow get wrapped up in my own narcissism, you know, my own kind of artistic drive. So, so the answer to your question is, you know, more broadly, it's a uniquely personal moment. And I could flip it towards you. What's the scariest one you've seen? Um, you just the conjuring. <laughs> she, that one there? Had you watched The Conjuring? <laughs> it is a terrifying I'm movie. Scared. What'd you say? I'm new to scary. Yeah. So The Conjuring's a good one to start with. It is a, it is a very well-made, incredibly well-acted, um, and very scary story. And then has that little tincture of verisimilitude also because supposedly it's somewhat true. And the woman who did the exorcism still lives down in Connecticut. And you go visit her house, and you can see the Annabelle doll and all that stuff. Um, it's a good film, though. Thank you. Thank you. Why, why is it scarier to read a book? Or at least for me, it's scarier to read a book than it is to watch a movie. Is this a thing that other people experience? It, yeah, it varies hugely. Um, so I'm gonna make a guess, I don't know if this is right. Are you a big reader? Uh, Do you read a lot of books? No. No, so <laughs> what's the scariest book you've read? I'm just curious, or what's a book that you remember that was scary? Not the scariest. This, like, I get scared at everything. I, I'm hearkening back to like middle school. I, think, when I, thought, I don't ever want to read a scary book again. So, so that's actually part of the answer, okay? S books, literature in general, leave the description to you, right? And that description then becomes in, um, personally yours. It's only owned by you. There's no community involved in that, right? It, so horror films are fun, I think more fun than horror stories, even though I write horror stories, because the horror story is, you know, is owned only by the person reading it. You can't ever possibly share the images that you have with other people. When it be gets up on the screen, Coraline was like that for me, the Neil Gaiman novel. That novel is terrifying. The movie was less scary, because suddenly I had an image that now took the place of it. I don't know which is better, but I think it's that that um, lonesome ownership of the narrative that happens, that's wonderful about books. It might be one of the reasons Stephen King doesn't always translate so well to the screen, too, because you lose that internal scene that you get. Hi. Um, hey. do, do you find any correlation between um, someone liking horror films and um, a, a better sense of kind of a better adaptability to fight or flight, like a better survival skill? So it's been, it hasn't been looked at as, as in a way that we'd like to look at it, or the way I'd like to look at it, because it's hard to get funding for that kind of study. Um, but there is a suggestion that people, so, so it's the sort of flip of what you're asking. We know that folks whose, um, 
who don't have a strong autonomic response in times of crises tend to do well in times of crises, but it's not a slam dunk. So if you've seen the famous um, heart rate monitoring of, of the first uh, moon landing, and one of the astronauts' heart rate was going through the roof, the other astronaut was steady at like 58. Um, they both did wonderfully. So we have this way of sort of being adaptive regardless of how it's affecting us. I think, um, the, I think what you do develop is a um, capacity to sit through the movie that, you know, in the beginning it's harder to do, but the more of these movies you see, it's not that you're not scared, but you know you're, you're sort of more reminded that it's not real. I think we'll leave that space soon with the virtual reality space. Um, so if you've ever put on those virtual reality things, it's, it's suddenly, like the screenplay we just wrote, you can, we direct noise this way and the person looks that way and then we have something come up right here. So then if you look back, it's there in your face. Um, and that's, that's, you know, not like being in the theater because you're the only one experiencing that. Um, so like about virtual reality, so at what point does that entertainment start to become trauma, be traumatic? I, there's sort of like lots of points where I'm staring at a dark corner of my room. Twice, yeah. Or I'm waiting for... Well, and that's, it's, again, this is what I love about being a psychiatrist. It's an incredibly individual thing, right? So your traumatic dark corner is somebody else's muse for a story. And there's nothing wrong with either one of those. You just have to know it about you, right? You have to know dark corners, not for me, I'm assuming, if, if that's your case. The issue with virtual reality is you can't get, I mean, there's a lot of movies about this right now, right? You can't get somebody out of it once they're in it. They can take the goggles off, but it's very, very hard, if, you, if you've ever put them on, to, to remove yourself from it, even if it's horrifying. The only thing that makes people remove it, actually, if you look at the data, is, is a feeling of nausea. So if they feel like they, they're like losing their balance and they might throw up, then you, then you take it off because that's such a strong um, you know, evolutionary drive to stop something. Uh, the flip side of that is there's a lot of virtual reality therapeutics right now. This is something we'll talk about on Thursday at the WGBH studio. Using scenarios to treat um, things like PTSD and well, simple phobias, definitely, but also PTSD. So retelling, for example, a scenario in the in the field for a soldier where somebody doesn't get blown up, and showing that scenario and having them learn to calm themselves down. So actually changing the story. They know it's not what really happened, but they need to see another version of it. So then it becomes anti-traumatic, but it's very uniquely individual, and we don't know yet. We're finding out. It's a great question. Hi, so hey. my question is uh, why some people like these kind of movies and why some people really hate it? Like, is there an explanation for No, that? no, I mean, other than, um, you know, there's this, there's this data that if you like it, you tend to like solving these puzzles in a high adrenaline state. People who don't like solving puzzles in a high adrenaline state don't like, um, like if you've ever done the, the escape the room things here in Boston where like everyone's running around and but someone's got to stay calm and some it's or, or calm enough to sort of take care of things those folks tend not to like horror films as much and it's not a judge it's just like a a personal difference that's why that scene that we showed you of Dawn of the Dead is so interesting because the scientists keep saying we have to be calm we have to be calm and George is just having fun with that because everyone's running around with their hands in the air how you can be calm there's like dead people trying to break into the mall you cannot be calm um, so it's, it's a, again, a uniquely individual thing, but a lot of it has to do with how much you enjoy, um, there's this thing called the need for affect scale, the need for strong feelings, which is a normal state, but you just enjoy it. Um, if you enjoy that, you'll tend to like horror films. Um, you'll also tend to like roller coasters. Um, Hi. Um, is there any correlation between people who maybe react, uh, like, in their dreams negatively um, to not liking horror films, or people maybe don't have nightmares about horror films tend to like them more? That's a really issue. I, I don't know. That's a fascinating question. I mean, it's it's also um, confounded by the fact that so many horror... I mean, there's a whole horror franchise with um, Nightmare on Elm Street, mm -hmm. right, where it's all about dreams being the place where the horrifying things happen. So. The confounder is that we've learned to be frightened of nightmare. I mean, that's we have a term for it, and therefore, if you get freaked out by your nightmares, would a, a horror story be worse or harder to tolerate? I haven't seen any yeah. studies or papers on that. My gut is again, it would really vary because I have frightening dreams sometimes, and they scare me. But I also sort of like thinking about them later, mm -hmm. like trying to figure out what made them so scary for me. Yeah. 
it's a, it's a really neat question. Have you seen Nightmare on Elm Street? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a great film. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's, it's scary because good, yeah. of the dream aspect. That's true. Yeah. Having watched uh, Li Night of the Living Dead literally the year it originally came out, yeah. I was just transfixed. But the, the thing is, it seems like now I go to watch horror films, and I really want to get into them, but it's like gore for gore's sake yeah. as opposed to a story. And I mean, even those strange Night of the Living Dead, no, they all had a story of some point. Yeah. And, and is that diluting the horror genre because it's become a gore genre? Yeah, so that's a, there's a, you know, there's a subset in the, in the horror literature. This is more the film literature than the science literature about the, the sort of gore side of horror. Eli Roth, uh, who's from here, actually, has made some really, really gory films. Gratuitous gore, I have a hard time with. I don't mind the bloody scenes, but if it's gratuitous, like just for the sake of what can you possibly tolerate, the only time I'll enjoy that if it's done kind of comedically. So if you sell like Tucker and Dale versus Evil where one kid after another falls in the wood chipper, like that just starts to be funny after a while because um, it's so ridiculously gory. Um, David Edelstein, who's the film critic for, the, for New York Magazine, among others, really nice guy. I was on a radio show with him, and he's the guy who actually coined the term torture porn. But on this radio show, I was all expecting him to, we were supposed to talk about this, expecting him to sort of say, I hate these movies, I hate the Saw franchise, which is the most profitable horror franchise in history. He said he started to feel that there was something to them, that there was something to, um, you know, it's, it's closely related to body horror, the Cronenberg the type horror, where, um, it's just the body being changed in some way and seeing how you feel like can, at what point can you no longer accept something as human despite the amount of, of uh, mutilation that's happening. I, I'm less comfortable with those films. The ones I really like are the ones where there's almost no gore. Um, there's this movie, uh, They Look Like People, if you haven't seen that. That's a great film right now. And there's almost no gore, but it is psychologically white knuckle the whole time. I'm curious about your opinion on how video games change the dynamic. In film, usually you're a spectator, you're sitting there versus in video games. Yeah. You, you, you're an agent. The choices you make make a difference. And I wonder if psychologically there's a different reward or a different Yeah, I think process. there is. Yeah, I mean, um, it, video games are designed, right, for, for intermittent minimal rewards that climb up a ladder. Um, it, the video game's first reward takes a long time to get to. People tend not to play it. They, and they, study this very, very carefully. I'm not good at video games. I'm too old. I don't work the consoles well. Um, but I read a lot of video games, like I've, and I've consulted to them. I think they've changed uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, one thing they've done is that there's no doubt in my mind that video games yielded the found footage world. So the, you know, the Blair Witch movie I don't think would have come about were it not for people seeing things from the point of view of the, of the main character. And then you have this whole kind of genre of found footage um, scenarios. And then you have games like um, Until Dawn where you can choose, I don't know if you've ever played that, where you can choose different outcomes there. My guess is as we move forward, like I was consulted with one company about um, horror video games, and their goal wasn't to actually have you solve anything. The goal was actually to make it a nightmare. So you reach for the door, and the door slides off. Um, all the tricks that you've learned in video games, like the things, the derivative things that you've learned to recognize, are no longer recog or they don't work anymore. You turn to run, and your legs get stuck in the ground, um, just like a nightmare. People, for some reason, enjoyed that, and I can see enjoying that. But I actually played it, like I, w I watched a walkthrough. It was terrifying. Just have, you know, I like the idea that I can eat my popcorn while I'm watching that happen. If it's my feet that are stuck to the ground, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. But I do think we're going to start playing with that, that virtual place. Thank you. All right, that's about time. Uh, I want to give a big round of applause again to uh, Dr. Steve Slossman. Thank you.